On December 31st, 2019, a novel coronavirus was first detected. This was the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. This event changed the lives of everyone, a change intensely felt by our healthcare workers and professionals. Join me, Ryan Funk, as we sit down with Manitoba-based frontline workers, immunization specialists, doctors, and nurses with diverse backgrounds to share their stories, experiences, and contributions during the pandemic in Canada. So today I have uh, Dr. Edsel Martinez with us to talk a little bit. Uh, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. How about we just start with a, a quick introduction sure. about a little about what you do. I'm a general pediatrician here in the city of Winnipeg, um, which uh, means basically, you know, baby, well baby checks, uh, immunizations. Uh, we see kids, adolescents for comprehensive pediatric care. For this project, yes. we're connecting with healthcare workers to ask them about their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. So we've had a ton of different people. But uh, yeah, just to get their perspectives on everything. So for yourself and yes. your practice, how did things change when COVID first hit? For us, uh, pediatric care, it, it was severely affected. Initially, I remember that March, March 2020, three years ago now, when things um the pandemic just uh, became <laughs> apparent that things were going to change forever. Um, we basically stopped seeing patients altogether um, at the office. I remember going to the office, and typically, if you go to our office, it's it's happening. Like it's there's you know mm -hmm. babies, kids running around. You know, it's it's a busy place, um, and it was empty like there's not one patient yeah and being there in the office during like you know a monday at 9 a.m and there's nobody there it was very different than what we were used to and we basically switched to all virtual care and for those first i don't know maybe three weeks we didn't see a patient so it's all over the phone um you know how are they doing uh, or if there's a fever but we couldn't see actually see the patient which um, impairs the way the way you assess the patient. Well, of if course, can, like if, if you're so used to those interact, like physical in person interactions, yes. trying to adjust to how do you learn to l figure out w what sort of symptoms and things they're <laughs> showing right. over virtual, over virtual with what the parent is telling you, and some parents will be more astute and, and be able to, to see things that maybe others can't and and you're trying to figure out um, do I have to worry or is this something we can give another day or two so we did that for maybe two three weeks and then shortly maybe after that we started seeing kids that were just healthy so healthy baby checks but if they had a bit of a runny nose, for example, then they couldn't come, right? And mm -hmm. whereas usually we're the place to go if you have a respiratory illness, okay, well, let's go see the doctor. It became, you know, turned around where, oh, you have a runny nose, so you can't, you can't see the doctor, you can't come with a runny nose or a cough. So a lot of those patients would have to go to emergency because they had the proper uh, PPE and, and staff to, to see those patients that we, that we couldn't see. So it also, uh, you know, affected how we saw our patients. With uh, one in individual, they're talking about some of the different technologies and practices that came in due to that virtual setting. They were yes. mentioning about listening to someone talk and how far they would go through in a conversation before they had to take a breath. Like if it was just a short little bit, it's like, oh, maybe there's some sort of respiratory illness or respiratory <laughs> infection going right. on there. Was there any like new technologies or things that came in during COVID to your practice? We were doing mostly by phone. I know other practices were able to switch to, to video. Uh, of course, we couldn't use Zoom. There was all this talk between Doctors Manitoba and, and, and practitioners. Can we just use Microsoft Teams or uh, Zoom? But it turns out, you know, you, you can't because <laughs> those things can be hacked and there's personal information. Yeah, there, there was a privacy issue. There's a privacy issue, so we couldn't use those things. So I know some pr some clinics were able to switch to paid services where you can pay for that technology. We we needed cameras. And we, had, we just couldn't make that switch fast enough. So we ended up being mostly by phone. And in pediatrics, it's typically the parent relaying mm -hmm. the information about the child, um, unless, of course, it's a teenager. But um, so it was challenging. Trying to, like, communicate over the phone with the parents, maybe, 
maybe they're not quite sure how to explain something exactly. the right way. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> part of the challenge of it. Um, but we were happy once we started to be able to see patients again slowly. And now, you know, we're not, I wouldn't say we're back to exactly the way it used to be, but we're, I don't know, maybe 80%. Closing um, in on it. Closing in on it. Yeah, definitely. During that period of time, of course, there was the pre vaccine yes. and then post vaccine. Yes. What were some of those experiences and thoughts you were having with, you know, just maybe other people at the practice and other people in your field at the time? What was your thoughts and feelings before the vaccine and then just afterward? It was a game changer. Uh, once we were able to get that, you know, a lot of us, you know, wanted to see our patients, but we we're also worried about our own families, of mm-hmm. course, our own health. But mostly for me, it was my, my children, my wife. Can I contract something at work and then bring it home? Um, and initially, I mean, there was it was hysteria, right? Like it was so much fear. Yeah, with people buying mass amounts of toilet paper, <laughs> yes. and then we there yeah. was the hand sanitizer that was gone, and gone. then certain medications. Masks, you couldn't find masks for a while. It was definitely a lot of fear. We just didn't know, right? So that was pre pre vaccine. Once I was able to get immunized, and our colleagues were all immunized, and my children were immunized. I think there, there was a bit of a weight lifted off our shoulders where, you know, even if we get it, the vaccine provides really good coverage for severe infection. I think I can start seeing, you know, more patients and, and kids with runny nose can, can come back to the office. Yeah. Post vaccine, it was it was definitely a game changer and it helped. And plus our staff, uh, you know, we have front staff, you know, some of them are, are a little bit older. And of course we were worried, you know, what if they contract the, the virus? Thankfully after that, after we were able to get the vaccine and a lot of patients and parents were vaccinated, it, it certainly helped open things up. I guess just during that time, I mean, you touched on it a little bit about the fear of potentially contracting something if you saw a patient, then bringing it home to your family. For you and maybe some of the conversations you're having at the office, what was that kind of like physical toll that COVID took on everyone and maybe, and and just kind of the mental toll yeah. as well? When I was going through it, I think I just, you know, put my head down and just, mm-hmm. and just powered through it. Yeah, something I heard from a lot of uh, people in the health field. I, I mean, I saw it in my children. Um, so my son is is nine, and you know he was the kind of kid where you're like, okay, let's have supper. Go go wash your hands. Do I have to? <laughs> and he went from that to you know completely the the opposite, and yeah. where he's constantly washing his hands, constantly sanitizing, even if he, he was just at home, you know. Um, so seeing that in in like my own children, hearing it from parents, the toll w- was there. Like even children could could feel it, right? It was mm-hmm. permeating everything. Yeah, and, and for me, you know, it was that fear of, more than anything, I was fearful of my children and, and my, my wife and, and loved ones uh, mm-hmm. getting sick. I think after, you know, now that we look back on it, it's like, wow, like, you know, we went through that. That was, it was so all-consuming at the time, um, but I didn't, I just didn't know it. You know, I found myself having more anxieties in general, whereas I'm usually pretty easygoing. I don't really you know, suffer from, from the, those kind of thoughts and, feel, and mm-hmm. feelings. But uh, I found myself just having more anxieties in general. And, and um, I mean, that's such worried. a human experience, right? Yeah. During this crisis situation, the fear for loved ones, the fear for family. It's such a normal response to have, how do I protect them? How do I take yeah. care of them during this time? Especially when, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty, especially yes. during those early days. Definitely. It was, it, I mean, it's a balance, right? Because I wanted to do my job. And I know that all the other parents are worried about their own children. So I, I mean, I want to do my job and, and reassure them and make sure that they're okay. And at the same time, I have to make sure that my family is okay. You know, it's a... It's a yeah, that delicate balancing balance act. there, yeah. What were some of those conversations you were having with parents at the time? Is there anything that kind of stood out to you? Like, obviously, there was probably a ton of questions coming your way. Yes. Oh, man. Um, uh, there was so much. I mean, you know, everybody wanted to know what, uh, you know, what are you hearing about? When is the vaccine coming? This is, of course, you know, very early on. Can we do this? Can he still go to soccer? Can he, you know, like all these questions about restrictions and and because there was so many voices piping in, like so many people that maybe shouldn't have been 
participating in this conversation through social media and everything. There's so many competing voices. It was really hard to, I think for everyone, including myself, to you know sort out through all that, like what, what is the actual recommendation? What's the best science that we have? So we had a lot of questions about what they could do, what they couldn't. Um, you know, schools would partially close and temporarily open, and, and are they going to close again? And should he go to school? Should he wear a mask? Uh, yeah, so, so, so many questions. Yeah, about you're feeling pulled <laughs> in every direction. <laughs> yes. That's all I can say. It was an interesting time, right? Definitely. With the information coming out. And, I mean, there's been a lot of, um, in these conversations we're having, we've heard a lot of different opinions on the information that was coming out of leadership at the time. Um, from your perspective, mm -hmm. how did you feel about the information coming out Our, from government, health officials, that sort of thing? First of all, we, we've we never gone through this, at least <laughs> <laughs> at this, in the most recent In this memory. sort of scale, right? That's right. We haven't been through this. Like, I hadn't, our colleagues hadn't, and our um, government officials mm -hmm. hadn't either, right? So we're all doing the best that we can at, at the time. I think they were doing the best that they possibly could, for sure. I think um, there were times, for sure, that the communication could have been clearer, perhaps more decisive to us physicians. You know, overall, I think they did, they really did, did, did do their best, right? So we were getting daily emails, for example, as this is the newest... Um, guidelines so every day so that was very helpful so it's uh mm -hmm. daily you know this is uh this is the recommendation for the vaccine um, because it was every day and sometimes it would change so quick sometimes it was it was hard to keep up with what uh so what is the actual recommendation now about either the vaccine the time you wait between doses the you know all these things um and sometimes you have to go, there wasn't one hub, at least not for us, for doctors, to go and, and have it all like, this is, this is all. Instead, I had, you had to go back on the emails and sometimes, you know, it'd be like 10 days ago, I know I read this somewhere and you have to go through all your emails. Yeah. So, and emails aren't necessarily the best place to get that sort of information. No. And then, and you know, the, the website had, some of the email stuff was on the website too, but you also had to go day by day. I don't know. It just wasn't. I think what we needed was like one place for doctors. You log in with your login, doctor login or whatever. And it was just like, you don't have to flip through 10 emails from 10 days ago. You just go and like, this is it. Like, we, there wasn't Kind of like anything. a single yes. landing page yes. sort of thing. Yes, landing page. These are the current recommendations you yeah. should be following. And then you can still go back maybe and look at your other stuff if you wanted to. But there wasn't anything like that. At least that I... Yeah, that like I maybe like there's like... An archive is like this is like yes. the dates on one side and it always had like the current one. That, that's right. So it wasn't anything like that. It was you have to go back because because different days was different different things. Right. So the, well, the mm -hmm. one day might be for the vaccine. The next day might be for some other thing. Maybe the type of mask you should be wearing. It, it was just a little so confusing some keeping communication up and kind of like that chain. Yes. Kind of trying keeping that in order. You know that would have been a little bit more helpful. However, I think they were doing the best uh, you know, mm -hmm. that they could. Well, every decision that they made had massive impacts on people, right? Yes. You're trying to look around it's like, okay, what is this province doing? What is this right. government doing? Okay, can we open up yet? Can, should we keep closed? And like yeah. every moment and every choice you make is going to drastically affect someone's life, whether that's the loss of life because of infections or just the closure of businesses because they just couldn't stay open. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to put into words what, what we've mm -hmm. gone through, not just medically, but um, medical stuff, but all the government. Everyone. <laughs> and, like, all, all these sorts of conversations. It's like, how, how can we better organize and utilize certain systems that are in place? And, like, for our healthcare system, when everything was going through, it was kind of pulled to the brink at times. Uh, yes. There was a lot of moments where people, like our resources were just stretched, stretched. to the max. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had mentioned a bit of anxieties and stuff. Mm -hmm. I never had um, had almost at one point a, almost like a like a panic yeah. attack, and I've, I'd never had one of those before. And it occurred sort of in the middle of the night, and 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 I kind of like woke up with you know my heart beating mm -hmm. fast and fast breathing, and just worried about <laughs> my patients. And that's what was in my head. Like, where am I gonna, when am I gonna be able to see all these patients? And that had never happened to me before. 
it, it was definitely taxing. Now that we're on the other side, and of course there are still infections that are going through, and I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, whether or not we should be seeing more of that in the news or infection rates and stuff like that. But now that we're on the other side, what do you think we can learn from the whole situation moving forward? I mean, there's going to be books <laughs> written on this thesis, you know, things that we should or should have learned from all this. I, I think, you know, we need all sorts of all different disciplines to hopefully come together and because mm-hmm. we've all learned different things, right? From a medical pediatric standpoint, it it became so clear to me how vitally important social, face-to-face social interaction is. I mean, we've always kind of known it, um, <laughs> but this was how imperative it is became so clear to me. From a baby, I still get parents saying to me, uh, oh, my baby cries when they see uh, anybody else who's not the family because they're a COVID baby. Meaning that these babies haven't seen a lot of people. They haven't socialized. That's right. And even, you know, yeah, a six-month-old needs to see other people face-to-face and for sure family. But well, other It's not like humans well. are a social species or anything <laughs> right. like that. Exactly. Kids didn't know how to interact with each other unless they have a screen in front of them, how to play with each other. And teenagers who've been at home all this time and then returning to school, we saw a sharp increase in anxiety, depression, eating disorders, panic attacks, OCD. All this mental health has had a huge increase in incidence over the last you know, three years. It's just uh, became so clear to me how incredibly imperative it is that we have face-to-face interaction. And as good as you know, social media is to link people together, to have discussions online, uh, to continue a conversation online, it's just not an adequate replacement mm-hmm. for face-to-face, one-on-one interaction or in a group. That was a huge, a huge lesson for me. Uh, I mean, it's imperative for adults and-, and uh, For everyone, uh, really. Uh, for everyone, right? <laughs> but uh, from my experience seeing um, kids and teenagers it was, it was an incredible reminder of the power of social interaction. I guess another lesson um, for me was just how um, misinformation, how... It can spread so quickly. How, how it can spread so quick and how fear can just uh, spread like wildfire. And it's concerning. It's one of the things that's left me really concerned is, is the power of misinformation and how quickly it can spread and, and how, how insidious it is, you know, how... Um, it can happen so quick. And, um, you know, I had friends of mine who were smart, um, logical people who, you know, didn't want to vaccinate or didn't want to listen to the, the public restrictions because they, he- they heard this or they read that. And, um, yeah, fear right. can do so much to so, a brand. <laughs> yes. And hopefully we've learned something from that. And I think we need, you know, we need our, our best minds on researching this misinformation, how it spreads and, and what we can do about it. How do we help those who have become misinformed and how do we help them, you know, logically come back to, um, you know, listen to, to scientific advice and evidence. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Martinez, yeah. for taking the time to share with us. Yeah, anytime. Thank you so much for having me. This project is funded by the Government of Canada through Canadian Heritage. 